What I wanted to talk to you about in this really brief intro is um, really getting to what um, Paul was asking us about wealth, what welfare state do we want. But very particularly, I wanted to make a distinction between what welfare state do we think we have, what welfare state do we actually have, and then lastly, what welfare state should we have. And I think there'll be much, lots of, like, kind of opportunities in the debate and discussion to maybe get more into this question of welfare dependency. But I'm not really going to focus on that so much in my introductory comments. So firstly, what welfare state do we think we have? So when I say we, I'm talking about the public in general. And obviously, as Paul said, I'm not, we're not thinking about the welfare state as a whole. We're really narrowly focusing in on social security in particular, which is only one element of the welfare state. I think the first thing we have to recognise is that at the moment and today, kind of ideas of social security and of welfare are just imbued in a really, really negative rhetoric. So they're seen as kind of inherently problematic. And that's something that I would problematise. But what we see is we see this notion that kind of reliance on social welfare and kind of so the state of being reliant and the people that are reliant are inherently and necessarily problematic. They're problematic groups whose behaviour needs to be addressed. And we see that kind of narrative and that rhetoric from our politicians, we see it from our media, and we see it um, in the massive kind of exponential growth in what some people term poverty porn. So this idea that there's um, kind of these reality TV programmes that kind of purport to show the reality of what life is like on benefits, such as Benefit Street, but which obviously shows sort of very edited, kind of sensational eyes, um, kind of idea of life on benefits. We also have, just to kind of give two examples, we have politicians who um, make some very derogatory, stigmatising descriptions of people on benefits. So we have um, David Cameron who talks about benefit claimants sitting on their sofas waiting for their benefit checks to arrive. So the idea that they're very passive, they're inactive, they're waiting for their benefit checks to arrive. We have numerous politicians, um, quite often George Osborne, talking about benefits as a lifestyle choice. So the idea that people are choosing um, to be on benefits. And inevitably, and unsurprisingly, this kind of dominant narrative then feeds into how um, public attitudes, and there's a kind of feedback loop and circulation between public attitudes to benefits and the dominant narrative. And so just to give you um, a few kind of examples, a recent like TUC YouGov survey asked public about their knowledge of the benefit system. And it's kind of interesting to see what people said. And so one of the questions they asked was, what percentage do you think of the welfare budget goes on unemployment? You know, how much do we spend on unemployment? And on average, people thought 41%, that was the percentage of the budget, is actually 3%. They were asked, what percentage do you think is claimed fraudulently? The public thought 27%, so quite a high proportion of our budget going on kind of benefits fraudulently. It's in fact 0.7%. Thirdly, they were asked what percentage remain claiming on unemployment benefit for over a year. They thought almost half, 48%, is actually 10%, so quite a kind of small um, proportion of those claiming job seekers allowance. And just something that's come out very recently is that over the past five years, 85% um, of allegations of benefit fraud were actually found to be false. So there's a kind of culture of, of kind of assumptions of benefit fraud, but people that were reporting kind of benefit fraud were found to be kind of mistakenly or, or kind of thinking that something was fraud when it actually wasn't. So that's the welfare state that we think we have. What about the welfare state that we actually do have? Well, the first thing to say about that is obviously it's a welfare state under flux, and that was the kind of subject of my own research, which we'll probably touch on a bit more um, in the discussion. But that there's been kind of wave after wave of welfare reform, which is kind of um, really changing and transforming the kind of what is offered by in social security protection to people on out-of-work benefits. And that's kind of justified and spoken about as part of a kind of effort to transform kind of the dependent populations into de independent, hard-working families. And what it means in kind of financial terms, I know Paul said not to talk about finances, but what it does mean in financial terms is a cumulative loss of 27 billion by 2020. And that's from 2010. And that's per year. And that's a equivalent to £690 a year for every family of working age. And that obviously includes in those figures people that don't receive any kind of benefit support. So you can imagine that the loss for certain families is a lot greater. In the kind of welfare reform process, there's a massive emphasis on welfare conditionality. And that's the idea that we need to attach conditions to benefit receipt. So if we're going to give somebody benefits, we need to attach conditions to those benefits to make sure that they are making the steps that we want them to make most often to return to paid employment. 
my own work, which has looked at people's experiences of welfare reform actually in Leeds, has found some of the various problems and challenges associated well with welfare reform and with being on out-of-work benefits in Britain today. And those include really severe poverty and hardship, um, kind of a pervasive state of insecurity for many people on out-of-work benefits and a worry and anxiety associated with what's going to happen next, what's going to happen to my benefits next in the next wave of welfare reform. And that can, of course, have very kind of negative implications for people's health. Um, it also troubles um, whether welfare to work works. So is the support available for people to move into work? Is the support appropriate? When people ask for the support, is it actually available? Um, just to say as well on the welfare state that we actually have, there's a lot of evidence, increasingly evidence in the public domain about the hardship that um, you know, people now face and people on out-of-work benefits often face. And I think that's really kind of um, visibly indicated by the massive rise in food banks in Britain today. And in 2015 alone, almost one million food bank parcels were handed out by Trussell Trust, which is our biggest kind of food bank um, provider. And also that there's a massive um, rate of kind of benefit sanctions being applied to, um, to people on benefits. And just last, well, the year to September 2015, almost 400,000 benefit sanctions were applied to people on job seekers. Um, in some work that I was involved in, <coughs> I worked, and we actually had the launch in this room here, so it's quite nice, but I worked with a group of benefit claimants to make a film about their experiences of welfare reform. It was called the Dole Animators Project, and they spoke about um, how they found welfare reform, how they found being on out-of-work benefits. And they ended the film with a quote, and the quote was a warning, and I think it's worth kind of repeating that warning to you here today. And they said, we warn you now not to be ill not to have an accident, not to lose your job, not to have dreams or aspirations. We warn you not to make the choices we didn't make. So that was their kind of assessment of the benefit system and the assessment of the welfare state as they kind of lived and experienced it. Okay, so I'm nearly done. So finally, just to say and to think about what welfare state should we have, and this is obviously just my personal kind of moral um, political viewpoint. I think that the welfare state that we should have needs to start with a recognition of our fundamental dependency and interdependency. So rather than a kind of fetishization of paid work, so rather than this kind of endless pursuit that we all need to enter paid work, we all need to be independent, hardworking families, we actually need to recognise that all of us in various complicated, difficult ways will be or already are dependent on each other, on our families, on, on our employers, on the, on, this, on the state, and that there's not necessarily anything negative about that. So I think we really need to trouble this kind of assumption that dependency is inherently a bad thing. I also think we need to do a lot more to question the kind of need and the rationale for welfare conditionality. Is this really the best way to set up our social security system? Does it actually work? Does it reap results? And does it kind of start with a correct analysis of the policy problem? I think that as well about endlessly, so from politicians we endlessly hear talk about the responsibility to work, I think we need to hear a lot more about the right to work and the right to decent work and that's a right to work that enables you to escape poverty and it's a right that's often denied to people, particularly for example disabled people. Fourthly, I think we need to do a lot to, to try and challenge and undo the stigma and shame that are associated with benefit receipt in this country today and that's something which my research um, found is a very kind of pertinent finding from the research. And I think finally we just need to try and think through how we can create a welfare state which we can all be proud of and that does grant security to us all in times of need. Thank you. Thank you very much.